Lauren, Lauren da Silva from Best Nights VC, VC investor in the nightlife alongside heavyweight co-investors like Lightspeed. Um, sitting here on my left hand side, Bob Magdzidlowski, former tech stars, music founder, investor for seven years, 70 portfolio companies, a lot of expertise. Xavier, Xavier Peters, my colleague, CEO of Lean Square, Lean Square organizing this wonderful summit. In his spare time, he's also a bassist player. We won't see that today, but uh, maybe some other time. Yeah, this is also the time to reveal secrets, you know. Great. Richie Patel, co-founder of Plus8 Equity, alongside Richie Houghton and John Aqua Vivia of Beatport, right? Uh, Hazel, Hazel Savage. Hello. Hello. Currently at SoundCloud, but she's... Uh, not only the only woman on the stage, but also the only, yeah, apart from me, uh, the only ex-founder, so she founded Muzio, that was afterwards sold to SoundCloud. Welcome, Hazel. Thank you. And last but not least, Ben Winter. Ben Winter is the face of the independent... Oh, am I? Well, <laughs> for here on the stage, yes, you are. You are now. For two night, you are the Association of Independent Music, and you also want to talk about angel investments and uh, syndicates. So welcome to all of you. I'm going to sit down. Um, so two parts to the panel. We are going to talk about investments and also about innovation. Hazel, can I start with you? Of course you can. Investing. Yesterday you told me something very interesting. You said, my mission is to demystify investments. Yeah, a, a little bit. And I think that's because when I was starting my company in 2018, I'd never met an investor before in my life. I'd never met someone with a PhD before in my life. And it seemed like this whole other world that was really inaccessible un un to people from the north of England. Um, and I just, now that I've raised money and sold a company, and now that I invest myself as an angel, I've realized it's as simple as anything else. You know, I just, you just pop a little bit of money in a company and um, you, you, that you like. And if you, you know, you meet the founders, you like the founders, you like the idea, you assess it as you would any, where are we going for dinner tonight? Hey, let's check the reviews. Let's, uh, do I know anyone that's been there? You know, you just, anything simple enough if you approach it. But I think that our industry does have, a, in a, the investing industry can be a little bit elitist and a little bit like, oh, you wouldn't understand. Like, it's very complicated. And it, I don't think it's that complicated. So I just kind of, push ahead and, and just do it anyway. Yeah. So we started with a positive note, Hazel. I think you're giving the impression that you're a very easy uh, investor, but I think the contrary. Well, is... yeah, I have a specific remit. So, and you know, I, I probably get sent about 20 decks a week, but I'm really only investing in music tech, AI specifically, and where there are proprietary models in-house. Um, so that really narrows it down because I might get sent some amazing decks for like a ticketing company or a, a live music company and, and uh, like it's just a straight no for me because I'm just a one person team. I can really only assess the companies where I'm qualified to know if it's a good idea or if it works. So, so I'm like super happy when I see those kind of companies, but I probably see 99% not that type of company. Okay, all right, Richie, do you agree? Finding investments, finding money for your company is easy. Well, finding money for companies is actually pretty challenging in music tech. Um, this is a <coughs> non-traditional segment of where VCs usually play, and it is a subset of the broader entertainment space. Um, it's changed a lot over the last 10 years since we've invested. Uh, there have been a number of funds who have identified entertainment tech or music tech as an asset class. That didn't happen many, many years ago. Um, so, you know, 
you sort of need instinctual internal knowledge of how the industry works, right? You need to understand the basics, have a network, how does copyright work, how does publishing work? A lot of folks in the traditional institutional world just have no idea about this. Um, we started a VC 10 years ago that was founded by industry practitioners, people who lived it and had successful careers at artists. Uh, my partner Rich is one of the biggest techno artists on the planet. My partner John co-founded Beatport. All of that knowledge comes to fruition and is manifested in the learnings as we apply our knowledge and try to inspire, guide, mentor next generation startups. And that's very, very important. Having someone like us on your team, I think, helps substantially de-risk an investment. And that's something we talk about all the time at the end of the day. How do you bring the right investors to the table that help mitigate the risk so that it can thrive or it can actually build traction in a way um, that will be palatable for the next round of investors and so forth. So it gets, there's a lot of different parameters um, that need to be considered um, in this space. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I want to build on that because, Ben, yesterday you told me that you're working on a kind of educational program for people who want to uh, create a startup. So I think uh, what you said, Richie, is you have to understand the business. So how do you act? Uh, to, to a degree, yes. Um, so at the moment, pulling together an investment readiness program um, within the music space. Most people that, that enter the music industry enter because of their love of music um, and their love of the creative arts. And then they might find success within that space um, and by default create a business. And then they want to scale that business. And the investment readiness program is, it's kind of dealing with the lack of information that I think you alluded to and the elitism that kind of exists that makes people shy away from uh, seeking out investment and maybe kind of looking at, actually, I'll just use my credit card because that, oh, that language over there, that scares me. That, that community over there, they scare me. So through the investment readiness program, what we're trying to do is ensure that um, music entrepreneurs are equipped with the knowledge, with the language, um, with the understanding of the investment space, so that when they come into the space, they're coming into it armed with the knowledge to succeed and secure investment. And then once they've completed the investment readiness program, they'll be able to um, submit their pitch decks uh, their business plans and submit for investment as we also pulling together an investment syndicate um, which they'll be able to, to put, put, put themselves forward to secure investment yeah. for. Okay, thank you. There was one word that triggers me to go to Lauren because you were talking about languages. And one of the things, Lauren, that you uh, told me when we were having a chat uh, in preparation of this panel was that you try to combine the language of finance with culture. That's correct. Um, at Best Nights VC, we invest into nightlife um, and are thereby a very niche-focused investor. And uh, the, let's say the cultural activists that we support throughout funding don't speak the language of the VC, the financial capitalist. So, and these both parties they don't really understand each other and we are the connector in between and translate and apply the tools of the financial uh, world to the cultural space to get their businesses funded, to bring them on the next stage. And um, language is a very important part of that. But next to language, it's also about reputation and authenticity. So the most important thing that our operations follow is to really like build that trust and uh, use this language to really like um, build something meaningful together with these mission-driven entrepreneurs that we collaborate with. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bob, uh, I want to come to you because you told me the state of investment in entertainment and music tech is terrible. <laughs> That does not sound like I did. I didn't know you were going to tell all these people I said that. Well, it was a test, and 
just to see it, whether it is they're objective. still awake. It is terrible, but it's... In con let me put that in context. <laughs> I think you should not run away because you hear the word terrible because now we are going to hear the magic, how to deal with that. I, I think where we are right now... And I'll, like, I'll, let me give you a little context. So I, I ran Techstars Music, a part of the Techstars ecosystem, a, a global accelerator. I ran it for seven years. Capital came from across the media and entertainment business. Some of my former LPs are in the, in the crowd. Um, a couple of my portfolio companies are here and there. Like there's a, there's a lot of people in this room who, who were part of it. Um, it did a lot of good. The, in the process of doing that, you make, you make 70 investments over seven years, you, you learn some things and you make a whole bunch of mistakes. You also get to sort of see some patterns. And the patterns that you would see were even for companies that end up with grade A investors and high valuations and really promising valuable uh, evalu you know, valuations on the company, the path for a media entertainment company to get there is just steeper and more arduous and harder because the, the global entertainment, media entertainment business globally is less than $3 trillion. Compare that to climate tech, fintech, health sciences. Uh, Xavier, what's your other focus? Um, future of industry? Yeah. Yeah, right? Um, by percentages, your meeting entertainment dollars deployed is a, a, it's not a, fra a fraction of your health life science deployment? It begins bigger and bigger, but it's a fraction at the beginning. A yeah. fraction, yeah, right? Um, and that's, that is not because the... It's because of the TAM of the market, right? It's just a smaller market. And so because there's less capital deployed there, there are less funds, right? Best Night's good fund, right? Best Night's... Um, also, you have a strategic interest in funding the nightlife business because the capital behind Best Nights comes from an alcohol brand. Jägermeister. Right? Okay, so the totally big good. Up for, big up for the bombs. I just I want to people to understand what's happening. Well. Like, I'm, I'm trying to contextualize my terrible. Um, so the reality is there are not a lot of multiple check writers. There are not a lot of people who have to completely dedicated funds. And the funds that are dedicated are small. So in, in the case of a, a media and tech, a really awesome media entertainment company, you have to then go get initial capital together, which is tough because there's less pools of capital. And then you have to convince sort of the grade A investors to make their one, maybe their second, maybe their, the third of their final investments into media and entertainment out of the rest of their fund, right? So that path is harder. And what we have to put in place, I think, collectively as a community, is a more organized process where deals are shared and there's, there are entities that need to be created that will write multiple checks in the life cycle of the company. And, that is, and that's part of their capital deployment strategy and part of the, way, the reason why they, are, they exist is to help move companies from layer to layer. Because if, you're, if you raise a, some money, let's say you raise a couple million dollars to start and you need to go raise that next big round of capital, really good, smart, grade-A investors are going to ask if your insiders are participating. And there are not a lot of entities that can write multiple checks. And so you, f you see a lot of companies piecing together their rounds and then going to the ne and starting over completely from scratch with a whole new set of investors for the next round. That is not true in climate or in med tech or in other, other categories. So that's the context behind I, I think it was, you know, we need to fix that. Yeah, maybe Xavier, you can comment on that. Uh, the need for strong consortia and also for ecosystems. By the way, that's the reason why we organize this kind of, uh, of summits to bring the community together. In what perspective is that uh, important for companies? Yeah, for sure. So, so I agree with you. But the, the market, it's quite, it's, it's huge, but it's quite difficult to access. Um, there is not so much investment fund or VC totally specialized entertainment because of the understanding of the market. Um, and that's why we have created Walifonia because we, we decided to go to the entertainment tech for many reasons. Um, because of this kind of market, because of, 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 of the relationship between the artist, major, the, the, the investor, the founder, we decided to create Walifonia just to put people around the table during four days. Um, there is a lot of other summit in 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 the United States, in Europe, etc. But I think now California is one, maybe one of the biggest in Europe, in terms of of, of music tech for sure. 
Um, and it helps us. I mean, when we, when we speak about education, we have to ed educate uh, the funders, we have to educate uh, the market, but also we have to educate the investor. I mean, I mean, I'm follow not. Follow on investors need education too. For sure. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I mean, we are not yeah. we are not the king in our kingdom in term in terms of entertainment. And so for us, it's really important also to be here and to not just to um, to co-found an event, but also to be here to listen to the market, to listen to the other investor, to listen to the founders, to listen to everybody, just to learn a lot about the market. And so we will be better in our investment, we will be better in our position on the market, and that's why it's so difficult to, 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 to have a... There is a lot of money on the market, I think, maybe not now, okay? But there is a lot of market, in the, but the entertainment is quite a huge and unfriendly for investors because they don't know the market. One, yeah, one more. To, to be clear, I think the, the, there's an opportunity right now that is massive yeah. to put a fund in place that could do some of this stuff. For sure. Right. Yeah. And, and one more quick comment from, from a macro perspective, the reality is in the entertainment industry, we're not mission critical in the sense that we're not curing cancer, we're not facilitating payments, we're not building infrastructure around um, the way people live, right? As people's standard of living elevates, you get to a point where people now are comfortable with the fact that they have access to food, shelter, water, whatever it might be. Now they need the next bridge elevate the entertainment. So if you wanted to start a fund in the you know, 1980s that was focused on entertainment or the 1990s, probably wouldn't have happened. But now we're in a very unique position whereby a lot of the global um, economies around the world have that standard of living and they're willing to pay for entertainment. And that's what creates the market. So it's still nascent now, but so agreeing with the comments of Bob and Xavier, we're at this very, very exciting inflection point for entertainment where we think it's about to explode and this is the right time to invest capital in it. Yeah, thank you, Rishi. Lauren, I'm coming to you because I see your non-verbal expression. <laughs> when Rishi is saying we are not curing cancer? I think we are curing something and we should be aware how important and how crucial this industry is. So uh, my approach while um, setting up Best Nights VC and pitching that vision to a corporate like Jägermeister was born during COVID where everybody on this planet experienced what it means to be isolated and the value of social interactions in real life, what it means to have coffee with your grandpa, a barbecue with your friends, a festival visit, or a relieving rave. So this is all very crucial for our own independent happiness. And nightlife contributes to that a lot. And nightlife is not just only the festival, it's also like the social gatherings. And uh, I pitched that vision with the idea to bring people together, but tech enabled. And um, I said it on an individual level, it's happiness. On a, a societal level, it's mental well-being, and mental well-being is quite important, and we see it. There's a loneliness epidemic out there caused by social media and caused maybe by venture capital due to the, not you, to us, I talked to me about like maybe? the venture capital financed last decade financing tech innovations under the umbrella of social, and now we see like 10 years later, what did it cause? Uh, is it really social? Are people together? Is it like the purpose that was behind that and I think the next decade is very much about culture and uh, only the companies or the products or services that understand culture and really bring people together and cause meaningful interactions will be the one with value and uh, hopefully the one that are successful and I make my best to invest into them and to give you also a bit of context about Best Nights VC the name came up with the intention of investing beyond core business of Jägermeister, so we're not looking for food and beverage brands. Um, it's not about optimizing the supply chain of Jägermeister, it's really going beyond core and exploring how the future of nightlife could look like and what kind of valuable business models are there that leverage quality, quantity, diversity and sustainability within nightlife. And this is tech enabled and that always follows one logic against the KPIs of traditional tech investors that use to track daily active users, monthly active users, screen time and so on. And we, we track social interactions. How many best nights do they create for their consumers? And best nights we see and our portfolio of 14 companies in 2023 leveraged 21 million best nights. So 21 million people went out and had a memorable experience with their friends due to the services and products of our portfolio company. 
and we want to push that to 50. And this was the yeah. context. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rishi. Very interesting. Uh, however, I would like to ask you not to mention all the time this brand of drinks because everybody is thirsty and everybody wants to I was expecting rooftop. beers. And <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I heard another word a couple of times already, excess. That's interesting because in Europe we are talking about ESG. Hazel, excess, is that something important for you when you consider potential investments? Um, as in how I access the startups or how they access me? Uh, well, provided as a VC or as an angel, you can contribute to giving access right, to okay, yeah. a lot of different... A lot of projects. Yeah, I get it. And I think this, this comes off the back of uh, what we were discussing yesterday. So I've done, I think I've done six angel investments in the last two years, which was when I sold my company. I started angel investing with the, some of the profits of, of the sale. And of the six companies that I've invested in, half of them have female founders. Um, I think all but one of them, no, two have English as a first language. The others don't. And I'm always looking to make sure that my portfolio personally is as diverse as possible. I think the global stat is it's somewhere between like two and six percent of all venture capital goes to women. Thirty-three, you know about. You got thirty-three, and also my lead investor, Wavemaker Partners, who did my seed round of two mil in 2018, they had thirty-four percent female founders, which is now it's close though. But that's that's really I think what tr more traditional VCs should be looking at. 33. As an angel, I can go even further. I'm like 50-50 at the minute. Um, and I definitely am probably more interested in looking at um, founders, uh, female founders. And also as well, I've just got SoundCloud involved and myself personally with them. Um, there's a program in the UK um, that Sony Music and Digital Catapult are running specifically black for founders. black founders in music tech. Um, and we're supporting that because, again, I think a lot of the culture of the music industry is built on black culture, black music, and we don't really focus enough on what black founders can bring on the tech side. So, yeah, so when it comes to access, that's something that's, that's really important to me. Can I maybe add something? Accessibility to funding in the cultural space is quite limited. And we had the reasons for that already. So institutional investors don't really speak the language, what we already addressed. And I think being then the gatekeeper to that industry, to that vertical, and speaking the language and enabling these founders goes hand in hand with education, where you like onboard these people that don't follow the traditional business school mindset that are more mission-driven, where you explain them how to prepare, how to get investor readiness. And on the other side around about, as you said, like educating investors as well, as like um, de-risking, as Rishi said, where we, with our expertise, come in and then within the syndicate, uh, create that comfort for the whole syndicate to take this deal and to go that way along. Rishi, um, investments in Europe and in the US in your perspective, what are the major differences? Because what we see very often is that startups that have, that believe they have a market, uh, product market fits, and they have an interesting, uh, well, uh, company, they go to the US first because they assume that there is more money available. It's a great question. Um, let me start by saying that the level of intellect and ambition um, <clears throat> and creativity is the same across both markets. And I love that, and that's why I appreciate both markets, because you get to meet very, very forward, progressively-minded founders in both jurisdictions. Having said that, the difference is valuation, access to capital, and overall market opportunity. And that's largely driven by the fact that the U.S. is coming up on almost 400 million people you know, in one country. Um, the EU is larger in terms of number of people, but willingness to pay and other metrics around that are not necessarily the same um, as, as the US. Um, other differences, the ease of business, uh, and I, I spoke with a couple of startups earlier today, um, the ease of even like the paperwork um, the documentation, what is required in terms of disclosure with the regulators, is much more straightforward 
in the US relative to investing in a German GmbH structure. Um, but that said, uh, I think what we're finding realistically is a lot of startups in Europe are challenged by the fact that the investor base is not as um, risk tolerant as they are in the US. And this is the fundamental difference. I think the biggest difference between the two jurisdictions. You know, if you look at the largest technology companies in the world by market cap, they're all American. Why is that? Because those guys took the biggest risk, the early investors into Facebook, Amazon, you know, whether Microsoft, whatever it might be, they saw a view of the world that was just different, right? Early investors in Facebook say, wow, social media, that could be a game changer. And the investors were receptive to that and put capital in. EU investors are, don't have the same level of risk tolerance, and it might be an education process, and just might be a misunderstanding of the market for, um, for tech and entertainment, whatever it might be. That's a very, very big reason as to the fundamental difference. Um, and access to capital is phenomenally higher in the US with behemoth funds. Well, like as an example as well, and this is without me passing judgment on Suno or Udio, but both of them have tier one US VCs, right? E exact, exactly right. You know, and, and you know, both those are game breaking, uh, game, ch game changing companies that will change forever the music landscape. And they're all US investors. There's one UK company called Eleven Labs, uh, which is sort of in the same mindset of Suno and Udio, but guess what? their entire cap table is stacked with US investors, not even UK investors. So the reality is that whether it's Europe or if it's US, if there's a super groundbreaking company that's carving a new path, it's gonna attract the, the risk appetite yeah. of the US investor, right? Yeah, right, I mean, I mean if, I, if I can, yeah. I think maybe in my European point of view, um, I think also that in US, there is a big difference in terms of mentality in terms of risk. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned you can, you can raise more money, you can raise with a, a higher valuation. I'm not sure it's, it's, still, it's still now this, the same. I mean, I mean, I think that the valuation is also going down a little bit in the US. But the big, balance, the big yeah. difference for me um, in Europe pr perspective between Europe and US, first of all, is the, uh, the mentality in terms of, of, of risk. You can take risk in US. Uh, you can you can you can fall in US. In Europe, it's not the same mentality, and also in terms of market, the US is more consuming market than in Europe, and so it's a bigger market. It's more accessible, and so people think, and a lot of Europeans go to United States because they they think that it's it will be easier in United States, and they come back in in Europe with no money in in the pocket. Uh, but no, but this market is is bigger than in Europe, um, and it's more consumering than in Europe. So, so it's, it's sometimes, in t for, for some startups, it's sometimes easier to go there than to, go to, to begin in Europe. But, but also, I think that from an investment standpoint, there's a better understanding of the, if you're talking music tech and music and technology, there's a better understanding of the intersection of music tech and the people than there is in Europe. In Europe, there are two very, very separate things, whereas in the US they understand music, music tech, and how that leans into culture, going to Lauren's point. Um, and we don't have that as much here in Europe, which is why it's a lot more conservative in terms of yeah. the approach to investment in that space. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of things to learn. Uh, it's also a matter of risk, Bob. What are the things you're looking at today that will be the big, um, yeah, innovations in ten years time? Okay, everybody, get their notebooks out. Here it comes. <laughs> I'm recording. Are you ready to get rich? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I. So first of all, I wish I knew, um, but there are a couple like. When we talked about this yesterday, I was sort of like, hey, current status is pretty terrible, there's, but there is this, there's a lot to be optimistic about. That's how, that's how we got here. Um, the lot to be optimistic about, I think, are that, uh, the, I thought about this last night so I could be succinct. Up until right now, um, the way streaming has revolutionized entertainment has been, to, like, if you, you could sort of summarize it as, uh, 
make all of the media play. So I think we're at the end of streaming entertainment, the revolution of entertainment from a streaming point in a 1.0 way, right? So streaming entertainment 1.0, make all of the media play. Make it play quickly, make it play on my mobile device, make it play on my tablet, in, a, in an airplane, on demand. In, on demand, anywhere I want for a reasonable price and make it work. I think it's about time for 2.0. And in the 2.0 part, I think we're gonna make all of that streaming entertainment multiplayer. Um, and you can sort of see this in gaming. Like gaming started out, like really blew up with like the Nintendo, right? We're all playing Super Mario Brothers. And it's a, un it's a one to one experience. Like it's me against, against you know, Super Mario Brothers. Um, yeah, maybe I have some friends around and we're fighting for the controllers, but it's really a one on one sort of setup. When gaming became multiplayer, all of a sudden like I'm at home, someone else is at home, we're both online, we're chatting, we're doing something together. Then you see social effect. Guilds are forming, people are working. The, the, you can literally watch gaming revenues and the size of that market explode exactly sort of in time when multiplayer became the dominant mode for gaming. I think that's coming for all of entertainment. So I've been thinking about it in my own thesis as we're at the dawn of, of sort of entertainment and streaming 2.0, which is play with all of the media. How do we interact with it, share it, collaborate, goof around, do things for fun. Um, and the examples I would use of that is like, um, like everybody know, everybody's heard BBL Drizzy, right? The sort of AI assisted uh, hip hop track, right? If you go into Spotify or Deezer or Apple or whatever, there's a, there are tons of playlists of kids from all over the planet making their versions of this track. This is play with the music. None of these kids are getting royalties. None of them are doing it for the money. They're, getting, they're doing it to be part of the conversation and to be included and, and raise their hands and say, hey, we're part of this conversation too. Here's our angle on it. Um, I think it's delightful. It's so fun. It's beyond entertaining. And I think that like, there's a whole bunch of businesses that are gonna get built around organizing that activity that's already happening all over the internet. Um, and that's a good thing from an investment perspective, right? There's like, Billions of dollars have been made by investors who have just gone out and looked at disorganized behavior on the internet and built, helped fund and build services to organize it. And I think we're at a moment right now where in entertainment 2.0, this multimodal thing gets organized and a whole bunch of new experiences get, get built. Rishi, what is the role of tech in this picture? I mean, it's, it's a massive role, and I, I, love, I love Bob's comments. You know, I think the big question is in this new world where we are building business around people enjoying the journey of the creative process, where and when, if that happens, does the novelty wear off, right? When they're 30, when they're 40, are people still having fun messing around with media, and does that still create an opportunity for the business? Um, but generally, you know, as we see it with, with tech, I mean, tech has been um, the, the catalyst, and that's a great word to use, to unleash um, new ways to create, consume, and distribute content at the end of the day. Um, you know, we invested in a company, um, and when we talk about tech, this is frontier innovative tech. Uh, this was a company called Overplay. It's sort of in a gaming music, but sort of more gaming sort of, um, sort of profile. Um, I met with the founder, you know, a couple years ago. Well, first of all, we had two calls and I still didn't understand what the hell he was doing. And so I had to meet with him in person because he said, I need to show you. So he took a video of him mountain biking down a hill and then he ran it through his tech, the same video that he took on his iPhone. And then the next thing you know, it's a game where I'm playing with my phone, him racing through the bushes and the trees. And I was like, this is insane. You turned this video that you took into a playable game. What's the vision here? And he said, straight up looked me square in the eye. He said, I don't understand why people are watching TikTok videos when they could be playing them. And my mind was blown. And I literally was like, how much money do you want? And it was so remarkable. It was tech enabling an enhanced experience in terms of engagement in the context of a social media profile. And I'm excited to see how music is gonna fit within that pattern. So to your question, what tech can do to unleash another level of experience and engagement as well as the creation 
um, consumption and distribution patterns is unbelievable and sort of the focal point of this conversation. Hazel, is it also important uh, when you consider investments? Um, I, I was just thinking then, and I, th I think Bob and Rishi said it really succinctly, but I think I'm looking for something slightly different. Um, and also, I, I turned 40 last year, and I don't want to remix anything. I don't want to. I don't want to listen with my friends. I don't want to like. Wait till you turn 50. It, change, it all comes yeah, right back to you. All comes back. <laughs> Good, because I was like, I, if I had a, if I had a dime for every every time I've been pitched the, it's music streaming, but you listen mm -hmm. together. FYI, I got BBL. You know what BBL? stands for? I got that into the panel record. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Brazilian butt lift? Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's and I just got you to say it. It's on the, yeah. Well, like, I'm cleaning up in the pool in the back. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I live in Miami. I just found that out. That's $5. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, there's so many apps where I always get pitched, like, it's music streaming, but you listen with your friends. And I was like, I have a lot of friends. None of them want to listen to the Bon Jovi album these days from 1994 on constant repeat. If they did, they would just come to my house. But they don't. They don't want to listen. So I, I'm not, I don't disrespect the, uh, the remit, but I think mine is slightly different and the way I approach it as an investor, which is just, you know, when I started an AI company in 2018, what we were doing was like, right at the edge of what was possible with the technology available, with the GPUs from NVIDIA that were available, with the, um, with the code that could be written to move this technology as fast as possible. And it only got easier the longer that we built. And we, we were around for four years before we sold. And so what's possible now in 2024 is like click of a fingers versus how, how we had to do it in 2018. So the companies I invest in, um, Audio Shake, Master Channel, uh, these kind of proprietary AI models, I'm interested when there's almost been a, a tech switch. And I go all the way back to like one of my first jobs, I used to work at Shazam. And actually, we were a UK company with all American investors. Because again, like nobody in the UK believed you could recognize a song on a phone which like that was the belief at the time. That was like 20 years ago. Um, and I think those are the texts I'm interested in where you see a technology that's almost imperceptibly different from magic. You're like, how the heckins did it do that? So when I'm looking for companies, I'm less looking for that societal change. I'm looking for a tech that I know hasn't worked for years or something that has been theorized and isn't possible and is now possible. So I, I think that's, that's where I'm in the kind of that deep tech approach. I, think, I have one of those okay. two, I'll tell you about it. Okay, I think cool. what's also important for the music industry specifically is with the innovation of music tech, um, the education of investors, because to your point with BBL Drizzy, that created a massive lawsuit because of the AI tech that was used, because of the way that AI was trained, and because of the fact that um, original creators weren't remunerated for the work that they did. So there's a whole education on the effect that some of these things can have on the music ecosystem and the long-term effect that can have. And I think it's really important that not only do founders, when they're coming up with a solution, look to actually understand um, the legalities behind it, but also the investors understand the long-term effects that that can have on a sector because it, it, it can be quite detrimental and the speed that tech is moving, legislation isn't keeping up with it. And you know, then you get into conversations about um, country by country legislation and does it correlate with, for example, in the UK, does our legislation correlate with the American, which correlates with the EU and so on and so forth. So how do all of these types of legislation come into play and with this tech, do you have a solution around the legislation as well when you're launching this brand new tech? So that type of education is really required with, with founders and with investors moving into this space. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just a last question to each of you. How can the audience here help you to achieve your goals for the next five, five years? Start with you. How can the audience help us or how, how, how can we help how, them? <laughs> Who could help you in the audience achieve your goals that you want to achieve in five years' time? Who would that be? What, what is yeah, the, the ask? Yeah, the way I would, the way I would say this is um, everybody will benefit if people share information, right? The, the, 
the default posture of the entertainment business is one of gatekeeping and I'm going to win a deal and I'm going to tell you about it after it's done and it and that that posture hurts everybody. Um, and so I the the thing I would say that would help the most in a macro sense that we could all do sort of immediately is like be open, talk about money, talk about the value of the company, talk about what the opportunity might be and who wins and who loses if this thing happens um, and be direct, right? Like there's got a lot of conversation happening about, uh, about AI training the, and in investment and high level music business circles, it's not really, it's just about money, right? The platform companies are going to pay um, the rights holders to train models. That's gonna set precedent the startups aren't gonna be able to afford to match those licenses. And so, I don't know if anybody in here plays poker, but big bank takes little bank, that's how it works. Um, and so, the rights holders are gonna get paid, the foundational models are gonna be available as a service. Like, those negotiations are happening right now, right? The lawsuit is about those negotiations. So, I think the, I think the, the fact that we're not talking about that publicly, and if you go look and read tech news and music business news, it's like, is it fair use? We're gonna sue them, put them out of business. No, actually, we're negotiating for cash, right? Tell everybody that. Everybody gets better. People build better tools. Business moves forward, right? So in any way where you're gatekeeping information about money or the development of your company or where your business is headed, try to default your posture to openness rather than yeah. privacy. Yeah. Okay, interesting, thank you. Hazel. Oh yeah, well I, I'm gonna, if, if Bob went macro, I was just gonna go straight to micro, which is like, you can add me on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> Hazel Savage, and also like I do read every deck I I do Hazel forward slash Hazel Savage. I do read every deck I get sent. So if any startup ever wants to send me a deck, I I read everything and I always give feedback. Please comment if you would like honest feedback or not, because I give it, and it, sometimes people are really horrible to me. And um, so if you don't want to hear why I don't think it's a good idea, that's okay. And also understand that I if it's not deep tech AI and I'm probably not going to invest, but anyone's welcome to send me a deck. So that's at the other end of the, the microeconomics. Yeah. Okay, Ben. Oh, gosh, I don't know where to go from there. Uh, after you. <laughs> are you like, um, not add me on LinkedIn? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess if there's anybody that's interested in investing in uh, new music, um, tech, rights holders, etc., and would like to join the syndicate, Come and see me, speak to me. I too am on LinkedIn. It's Ben Winter with a Y, not an I. Um, yeah, feel free. Um, I, I'll take both the micro and the macro. On the micro, since we're talking about that right now, similar to Hazel, um, I read every single deck that we've ever gotten. And I wouldn't recommend necessarily for investors that LinkedIn is your primary source of deal flow. Um, having said that, we might be the only investor that's actually ever invested in a company that we got sent a deck from LinkedIn, and it's one of our most exciting investments. Um, from a global perspective, um, I think um, having a global view of the world in terms of entertainment is really, really important. You know, as a US, as US investor, I spend an unbelievable amount of time out of the office in international jurisdictions. You know, I'm involved at Wallafornia for many, many years. I've spoken at Tech Open Air in Berlin. I've spoken at Nylon Connect in London. I've done, you know, the XB Music Features Conference in, in Riyadh, um, you know, Sonar, whatever it might be in Barcelona. Like, you have to have this global perspective lens about entertainment because you have to understand how all of these demographics are creating content, consuming content, um, and how that entire ecosystem relates to the, the, the bigger picture. So if you are just living in a bubble in LA, you're just not gonna get it. If you live in a bubble in Berlin, you're just not gonna get it. But if you understand the sentiment across those, those countries, nationalities, and municipalities, you're gonna have a much better perspective on how to run your business. Xavier, how are we going to make money in this house? Uh, for me, I, I, I would like more transparency, discussion, and understanding between the, the music industry and the startup to be sure that when, when I receive a, a deck, and I, I totally agree with you with this new tech, this new kind of tech, this just not a, another funny tools, but it is a really new tech who answers a need on the market. And to, uh, just before 
discussing about money because there is money on the on the market. We can we can find solution to to finance a company, but I would like to have more transparency, understanding in the, between the, the 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 industries and the uh, the founders. Lauren, you're the last one because I didn't want to run the risk that you are going to mention once again <laughs> the brand of the drink because then everybody is going to rush out of this room. I don't. But I agree to everything that you just said, micro, macro, uh, music. And I think what I want to contribute is that we are at a so niche event here, really like very focused around culture, music and tech, and then combining it with finance, it, it requires collaboration. So I think collaboration is key as an investor, but also as an entrepreneur. And I think you will be stronger together. So join forces and send your decks, bestnights.vc. Yes, and best nights, uh, this is an invitation to all of you because there's another party tonight, so you have a chance to make it your best night oh. in Liège. Okay. Thank you to everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks to the audience. Thanks so much to Noshak and Lean Square also. Like, this is really nice. This is, you guys do a great job. I, I, you guys get a, you should get a second round of applause just for the effort to put this on and bring people and hook it up. Like, it's a good well thing. Well done. For Ali, Jerome, it's for you. This one is for you. This, one, this round of applause was for you.